now we're talking about um, the government grant and intervention, of course, dissecting how all of the situations um, or, or, or intention of uh, the federal government has been meeting the people. So poverty and unemployment are on the increase in Nigeria. In recognition of the situation, the federal government in 2016 introduced four key social and, um, of course, social inve investment programs, which include the conditional cash transfer, the Empower. Uh, we saw the government enterprise and empowerment program also um, created and the homegrown school feeding program to reduce the poverty level and promote inclusivity. Now, this morning, of course, is what we'll be focusing on, the government intervention programs and the impact of these programs on Nigerians. We have in the studio with us the former coordinator of National Social Investment Program, Dr. Omar Binder. He is also the Baba Moti of Adamawa. Good morning. It's good, good to morning. have you, Doctor. It's a pleasure. Of course. Yeah. So, uh, first of all, Doctor, let's talk about your take on, you know, you came in and you you saw how the program was progressing on people talking about the current 50,000 um, Naira grant that the federal government has implemented since uh, last year, December. So what is your take on all of this? By, by hearing the fact that some people were receiving this, are still getting it, and then others have not ever even heard of it before. Yeah, I think... Um in line with the government's priority to target poverty and inclusivity. I think 50,000 Naira, if it's a grant, meaning it's free, mm. you just take it and you get on with it. If it's a loan, it means you repay it. Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, but uh, Nigerians must understand that. First, on the government side, targeting is key. You have to pick the people who require it. Who will utilize it effectively? Who will change their lives using that seed money? Uh, on the people side is that you, when you take the 50,000 Naira, ensure that you utilize it very well. Remember, in this country, the largest sector that is driving this economy, whether you like it or not, is the informal sector. It's those women selling smoked fish, those women selling dudu oshun, those women uh, 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 smoking meat, the ones that are making pomo, the mama puts, the ones making puff puff. This is it. There is no house in Nigeria that you do not have that informal entrepreneur, whether it's for survival or commercial. Mm -hmm. Now, imagine such a woman. My mother was one of them. You know, uh, if she, you give my mother when she was alive 50,000 naira, you would have confused her because it would have been too much money. Mm -hmm. But that woman, like most mothers, she knew how to extract oil out of groundnuts. So she has groundnut oil as a product, and she has the cake as a product. She can use the cake to manufacture kuli kuli, which is another product. She has that skill. She's a full and human, therefore she can make yogurt, very complex chemical uh, process. Mm. She can make it. She can weave, you know. She can make soap, not just soap. She manufactures the raw materials. The potash, my mother manufactures it. She doesn't buy it from the market. She has her own ash. She soaks it in a very, very and collect the filtrate and then utilize it with palm oil to make soap. So now most women, most mothers know this. Now imagine if you were to inject 50,000 naira on this woman and then gradually enrich her thinking to say that, Look, Mama, every Wednesday, bring that two bottles of granite oil out, we will buy it. So you have off takers on one side who is collecting all the two, two bottles of oil and it's a cash, cash and carry. Mm. And if you were to do that when I was young, I would have gone to the university with a car because my mother would have been a business mogul. Indeed. But that did not happen at that time. So it is an opportunity now. 50,000 naira is a lot of money. Yes, if you're in Abuja, if you're in Lagos, if you're in Ibadan, you may think, oh, what is the government doing with 50,000 naira or whatever? But when you're a rural woman, a, a, a full-time housewife with your three children and so on and so forth, 50,000 naira. So it's a very good initiative. But, but based on the targeting, doctor, yeah. do you think that the federal government were able to reach at least the 10% intended for, um, you know, elderly people and, of course, uh, almost 70% to the women and youths? Well, you see, the targeting process is a highly technical process. Indeed. People take it very simply, you know. How do you now weave through the community? In, in, remember, the people who may help you, 
would be maybe the politicians. They are representing people. You have 109 senators, 360 House of Reps in Abuja alone. You have 36 governors and deputy governors, right? Plus the minister of FCT. You have 774 local government chairmen, mm -hmm. all elected. You have nearly 9,000 ward councillors elected. All these are leaders touching people directly or indirectly. On top of that, you have the traditional system. They are also very, very close to people. So the targeting process must be multi-sectoral, multi-people oriented to help you. And that was the idea when we were doing the cash transfer, the National Social Register. Mm. The National Social Register goes down to the bottom, to the village to say, oh, that house there, there's a woman who is a widower. There's a blind child. There are three children that are out of school. Therefore, it's a poor and vulnerable house. Tick. You know, the people, the community themselves does that. So the targeting process is highly scientific. But if you do too much scientificness, it will take you time. But if you collaborate and you cooperate and you advertise and you give information, it makes it easier. Remember, 50,000 naira for one person or one business, if you give one million, it's a 50 billion naira bill. Mm. Only one million. And, you know, in one town, you can get that one million. In Lagos alone, the UK, that one million, if you close your eyes and open it, you can get that one million. So it's very expensive. Therefore, the targeting is very, very essential. Hmm. So that the first one million that you target may turn up to be three million. Because my mother would, by the time she walks maybe for a month or two, with her 50,000 naira making oil and do ocean and so on and so forth, her business will expand a little bit. And she'll find that it's too much for her to do it. She may invite her sister, my auntie, to come and help and that's her. An that is a job people. created. Indeed. So that is the idea. Indeed. You know? All right. So let's talk about the um, national social investment programs um, and, and the social um, economic impacts of government grants in the country currently. Now, a lot of people have been, you know, saying that this kind of thing are not really needed. The government should pay attention more to the state of the economy, and that would, you know, naturally elevate the, the system. But then you have been in this system. You've worked with it. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of the benefits. So can you tell us, you know, the essence of the NSIP? Um, well, you see, governments normally must handle two things. The macroeconomic issues, exchange rates, you know, uh, the, the, the institutional development here and there. But they also have to put their mind to the micro. These poor people, this is in the majority in Nigeria. We're talking of poverty incidents ranging at average level around 40 to 60 percent. Meaning if you collect 100 Nigerians, 40 of them will not have good water to drink. Their housing is not very good. Their food is not very good. They are not smart to, well, not that smart, but they don't have skills that can, they can gainfully provide products and so, and so on and so forth. So social investment in most developing countries, if not all, is very, very important. And in my opinion, our governments, our leaders have always recognized this. You know, if you trace in history, even during the military era, Abacha did FIP. Uh, when Obasanjo took over, he did NAPEP. By the time Jonathan took over, we have UN and Shuapi. Hmm. Now we are talking about NSIP since the Buhari regime to now this. So poverty alleviation has always been on the table of government. But the critical thing is targeting and measurement. You have to target well, and then you have to follow the targeted and see, are you winning or not winning? And uh, in my opinion, you know, uh, people must understand. In this country, I think there is some kind of demonic thing somewhere that is protecting or stopping us from development. Anytime we start something, we think we are bad, we think we are corrupt, we think we are thieves, and we stop it, we shake it, and so on and so forth. But this thing takes time, you know. The social investment program came in 2016, you know, under the then office of the, His Excellency the Vice President. By 2019, when the government created the humanitarian ministry, it moved to the ministry. That's 2019. Remember, it was in the 2019, towards the end, that COVID hit, it obstructed literally everything, including the NSIP. By the time it re-popped out around 2020, 2022, 
It then started, then we got into an election. Now, because of these delays, people don't analyze the effects of these things. And then they wake up and say, oh, this thing has not worked and this is not going to work. But would you blame Nigerians, though? You know, speaking of the COVID, I mean, there's a current investigation going on. And then there's been an alleged, um, you know, misappropriation of those funds in especially the humanitarian sector during that COVID period. So would you blame Nigerians for being a bit skeptical? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't blame anybody, to be quite honest. Everybody has a right to ask questions. But what I'm focusing on is the program. Hmm. Forget about, you know. So, and the way to deal with this problem is that we must be able to be digital and data oriented. When this 50,000 Naira, you have the 50,000 Naira. When you target the people that you are giving, you must know the whole data of the people that are taking this. When have they taken it? What accounts are they using? Which banks? When did you release it? What are they using it for? This to some people, oh, no, no, this Dr. Bin is too grammar, too much theory. But this is it, what makes people win. Mm. By the time you come back, the data you have alone will help you so that not, there's no person who will get it twice or three times. It will help you, you know, if you have all the biometrics and so on mm. and so forth. So, but then the data is what you analyze. The data is what makes you follow, monitor, evaluate and then see if you're making progress. And then you start calculating. You, I will ask you, how much were you getting when you, before getting the 50,000 naira? So my income was just 5,000 naira per month. Now that you've taken it after three months, what is it? Oh, it has improved to 15,000. Oh, well done. So what are you, are you expanding or you are eating the money? You, you have to interact with all this through your m &E system. The second thing is, you know, impact scientifically takes time. Your child does not go to primary school to get a degree. He goes there to get a primary school certificate, and it takes six years. And then after the six years, he goes to secondary school until you go to university. So the same thing with this kind of program. So scientifically, as professionals in this, before you measure the impact of programs of this nature, you need a minimum of three years. Minimum of three years of doing the right thing. So when His Excellency, under his renewed hope, is giving this 50,000 naira. Don't start asking tomorrow, what is the impact? What has he changed life? No, it's not going to, you're not going to get responses and replies. You have to wait, you have to work very hard, help the program to penetrate. If you see anybody doing wrong things, you report, and then data will tell you where you are. In three years time, we go back and start asking these questions. And you can now say, oh, it has come in, it has penetrated, and it's now yielding dividends. So Nigerians, we have to learn Number one, to cooperate with each other, to work very hard. Two, to trust our leaders that they mean well. Three, yes, when you see bad things happening, you should also report. Don't just swallow it and then criticize it and so on and so forth. And four, the objective is to win. Try to contribute to the winning stride rather than the failures. Hmm. It's always good to go back, you know, and see a bit of mistakes and, and great things that was done in the past in order to implement it in the current one. That way we get a better future. So let's walk down the memory lane of um, the cash uh, transfer uh, program that was done, the Empower, uh, the Government Enterprise and ent um, Empowerment Program, and also the Homegrown School Feeding Program. I mean, currently some of them has surpassed the three years um time that time that you think you know should be of course taken in order to uh, check the impact so what would be the impact of this whole programs you know considering that you've been definitely part of this system i think uh, if you start with the cash transfer the target since 2016 was to target two million households and that two million did not just happen two million it's a gradual process by 2022, the program has hit that 2 million benefit, benefiting households. So there's every household. Initially, when it started, you get a huge bag of money on a table. You are counting 5,000 naira. And then you get the one person who is representing the house. We call them the caregiver, right? Mm. The caregivers are all killed up. One, two, three, four, five thousand here. They, they, thank you very much. And they go. It looks ridiculous. It is even it was branding this country as a very backward country, but then by 2022, nearly all the one uh, the two million household caregivers have accounts. They even have cards. So somehow you see programs evolve 
on the basis of experience. Mm. You know, we were very lucky. Even we never had any episode of armed robbers coming to a, a distribution point to shoot everybody and then carry the money. We never had that kind of thing. So you see, that is the graduate. And we have seen households that have changed. We've seen caregivers that have come together to form cooperative societies that are examples, you know, where women have decided even in a community, based on the house, what they were given, doing things, and then even building a classroom in their primary schools, hiring teachers to teach their children. There are women to do the cash transfer that have put together their contribution to buy a, an old bus to serve as an ambulance, taking women to the nearest primary health care facility. So yes, but there are also things to learn. There are, it's not just Uhuru all the way. There are bad things that have happened. There are people who will run after you and make sure that you are doing the wrong thing. We discover that. And, and, and so that is basic, but you can have a whole lecture on that. When you come to the school feeding program, exactly the same thing. You know, the school feeding program has a very strong relationship with the state government. The federal government has the, the money to feed the children, but the state government, they are the ones that actually give the data on the schools and the number of peoples. They are the ones to select the cooks. They are the ones to ensure that the suppliers of the food materials are there. So again, initially, it was very, very difficult to trigger it. Some states even refused, like by and said, no, 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 we don't want this too complex and so on and so forth. But then gradually, we started now filtering the data. We were feeding nearly 10 million children, you know, in, around the nation. Hmm. And we knew every single school on our database, the name of the school. So we realized that, oh, we need to capture the names of, of, of the headmaster. We need to get the biometrics of the children. Remember, it was only classes one to three hmm. of the primary schools. By the time you graduate to class four, then you, you have graduated out of the school. So again, we learned a lot. There were cooks that were not cooking, right? There were cooks that were cooking less. There were also schools that are excellently doing very well. There are places where even the staff, the civil servants in the state, were inflating the numbers. We were only getting the numbers digitally, you know, and then we discovered that too. So we started going more digital to go to the state, strengthening our monitoring and evaluation. So again, it was working. The, the schools where there was nothing, we've seen the improvement of the enrollment. Children were running to school because of the food. Parents were telling us, now we don't need to scream our, 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 our voices to say, go, Matthew, go to school. Early in the morning, they've already watched they are running to school because of that need. So to a certain extent, it was winning, you know. Then you come to NPower. NPower really had a huge impact in my opinion. Yes, again, there are challenges hmm. because NPower, the graduate ones, nobody gives you any form. Nobody asks you anything. They just give you a portal. You go there because you know what to do. You put your name and so on and so forth. And by the time the program finished, we were doing nearly 1 million beneficiaries, you know, around maybe 900,000 uh, or so of graduates and then the rest non-graduates. So again, the non-graduates were training, were giving them kits and so on and so forth. Many were successfully establishing their business, but there are also lessons to learn. Mm. There are young people who you train them, immediately you give them the kit. You know, if it is a mechanic, you give them a mechanical kit, plumbers, plumbing kit, a glazers, glazing kit, cooking, and so In front of you, at the ceremony of giving the kiss, they will sell it. We've, we've seen that experiences too, you know. So you experience a lot. But I mean, the social uh, uh, work is, 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 a, is, is a very difficult. The okay. jeep to do with the loan. We started with the loan of only 10,000 Naira in 2016. You know, mm. and then so again, the targeting was the, the vice president was going to the market. Women will queue up. They'll be taking this money. It was very, very unique in the sense that it has no interest rate, that loan. And then it has no collateral. But actually, scientifically, if you think about it, anything that has no collateral is like free. Because even if you shout at the person, it's collateral. Mm. So, but they built it up. They worked with Bank of Industry very closely. They tried to implement the first phase. When we came in, the money has been increased by the approval of the then Mr. President to 50,000 Naira. 50,000 Naira for the market money, trader money, 50,000, and the farmer money up to 300,000. But the secret about microcredit is that don't expect any repayment if the person who is taking the credit does not succeed. It is no, you're not going to squeeze water out of a rock. You know? So the idea of the program is not dishing out the money. Even a donkey can dish out money. Sitting like this, it can dish out money. 
the idea is what do you do to make sure that the beneficiary succeeds? They need skills. They need to be introduced to new tools and inputs. They need to be advised constantly. They need material to know what is happening. They need market off takers. This is the job, and this is highly technical. So if you employ people who do not know what to do, then they will put all their energy in terms of giving the money out. And then later they will come and tell you, oh, the beneficiaries are not paying. How can a beneficiary pay when they don't succeed? My mother will not pay if she doesn't succeed. If you give her the 50,000 naira and she cooks food for us and we eat the food, come back 20 times if you like. She's not going to be able to pay. But when you give her the 50,000 and you follow her mama, the raw material, we found groundnut in the ne ne neighboring village. You give her maybe one mudu or two mudu every Wednesday. She will say, ah, ah, the, Mama, you can fry it and put the granite in bottles. You can also uh, make the paste and extract oil. You can make kuli kuli and you'll make more money. All the kuli kuli you make, we will buy it on Thursdays. Every Thursday will come here and buy. Gradually, she will capture this. And before you know, you have a business. And then that woman can be able to repay. Hmm. I mean, this thing you're just uh, spelling out, Doctor, uh, reminds me of the current process of the student loan hmm. that, uh, you know, Mr. President is also implementing. And one of the things that was said was that um, the students were advocating for just create a kind of means that immediately we're done with school, maybe we should start working, then we'll be able to pay back this money. While other experts say, why not, even while they're in school, you know, they can create a kind of work that would bring wages, uh, you know, get to that. They may initially even start paying at the earliest time. So mm -hmm. that is, of course, your, your own uh, target. So with all of this that you've discovered, has um, the current um, government, you know, tried to think of that? say, perhaps, um, while they're giving out loans and all of that, creating, say, maybe once a month kind of um, event that would bring everybody, stakeholders, to share this knowledge of how to progress when it comes to, you know, generating and turning that money. I think if you want to succeed, you have to do these things. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, one thing that is going for this country is that the population require food and our agriculture is the key when you want to employ. Some people will produce, some people will process, some people will transport, some people will store down until you reach when some people can actually use it industrially or cook. I think every university should have a huge farm run commercially. And every student that is actually accessing this loan must participate on this farm. Let us make sure that by the time a young person, a boy or a girl, graduates from the university, even if it is a daughter of the president, that is the highest first class person that we have, they must carry home or at least use a small tractor, they must plant okra, they must harvest okra, they must go and actually feed fish, and they will, should wash catfish, they should actually go and remove uh, poultry uh, dropping, make it into organic fertilizer. Let young people start thinking that, oh my God, when I graduate, I'm going to keep 200 chicken. It's not a big deal. Although I'm doing mechanical engineering, this is to, I can construct the house now. I can do all my roofing using my skills, and I'm going to utilize, uh, I'm going to run to a bank and get a loan to actually run a poultry. This reorientation hmm. is very, very important. Just in addition to the general studies that we normally teach in the universities, we must bring farming into it, whether it is in Lagos or in Ibadan or in Maiduguri or in Sokoto, anywhere. You, federal universities should starting with must have a big farm, land is not their problem, and then bring the new inputs, the pumps, the irrigation, the planting methodology, improved seeds, storage system, processing system, and showcase it to the students that see jobs while you are in school. And when they graduate, maybe 40, 50% would have been convinced, and then we will see the loans be repaid, and then the whole revolution will start. Hmm. Hmm. So, um, based on your experience mm -hmm. i mean you've made mention of um how they can actually make these people to be able to repay back the loan to grow and all of that but then based on your experience what more improvement do you think the government needs to do in terms of grant well i think like we we said is grants are good grants is free right but concentrating on the money is the easiest thing government will budget or will facilitate for pool of resources to come, and sharing it, if you don't target it very well, is the easiest way.
But remember, if you are quenching poverty in the country, the poverty incidents differ. As we speak, at the state that has the highest poverty incidence of 88% is Sokoto State. The state that has the lowest poverty incidence of 4.3% based on the Nigerian Bureau of Study is Lagos State. And you can understand, right? But in all these states, agriculture is key. So for me, number one, government must concentrate on the targeting process. We must make sure that we ginger the Ministry of Digital Economy to coordinate so many of these programs to build databases. We must know what we are doing very, very clearly. If you are going to do a grant, you must know who is taking the grant, the condition under which he is while he is taking the grant, what is he doing to utilize that grant so that you can make progress, and then down the line, month one, month two, month three, where, where is he? So that you can be able to pick the serious ones so that you can prop them up stronger, the weak ones so that you can support them, and the ones that are average that can just be left to be continue. You know, data, technicality is very, very important. Data its analysis, its utilization in planning, monitoring and evaluation is very, very important. You must follow this. It's expensive, though, hmm. it's, but you must do it. And then certainly your industry. We must continue to tell Nigerians what is happening, visually or by audio or by paper. You know, we, Nigerians must have access to information wherever they are. This is available. It is happening. It is changing lives. See for yourself, you know. So... The synergy is key. Unfortunately, in our country, that synergy is not very strong. We like operating as islands. Mm. This is my ministry. This is my state. This is my house. This is my television station. We must break these barriers to create avenues for synergy, partnership, and comp uh, you know uh, 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 we have to compare notes. This is what progressive countries are doing, and Nigeria cannot be different. In I mean, speaking on, of course, the knowledge, uh, uh, sharing the knowledge and creating awareness for it. I mean, some of our colleagues said they've never heard of, you know, s some of these grants that was issued. So definitely that is something we'll push for. So what are your hopes, you know, for the future of social safety nets in Nigeria? I think one of the biggest uh, nets dragging Nigeria back was despite all the opportunities it has to shine, is poverty. Poverty is too high in this country. Poverty is creating insecurity. Poverty is creating despondency. And we have a lot of young people who are dropping into this. I think my hope is that we have to get very, very organized. There is no country that will have over 250 universities and still dwell in poverty. Quality of education, engineers, medical doctors, architects, and so on and so forth, does not coexist with poverty. When you have good universities, good polytechnics, good colleges of education, and we have many, how can, you, how can that coexist with poverty? We have to break the barriers to ensure that what is happening in the universities is actually quenching poverty. So we need this synergy. We need to see that poverty coming down. It is dropping the poverty that is actually going to make sure that we are working together irrespective of our religions, we are, resp we are respecting each other inside, irrespective of our gender, we are working together irrespective of where we come from. Once poverty drops, because I can tell you, I've worked in many countries, I've done many of these things, I have not seen a country where young people have something to do and they are doing it and getting some gainful payment and they work for eight hours a day, they are tired, they go home, they now eat something, they wash, and then they now flex and say to them, it's now time to go and kill people. That does not exist. So it's very, very important to get young people busy, gainfully, and gradually you will start seeing that you will not see the ebonness in people. You will not see the fullness in people. You will not see the urbanness. It is prosperity that will quench it. So we must work very hard to quench this poverty that is very Indeed. high. Indeed. I mean, speaking of working very hard, everybody needs uh, to have all hands on deck. And when it comes to this, you pointed out a lot of people that need to also participate to make the success of all of this grant easy and successful. So let's talk about the state government. Pointing out example of Sokoto being one of the poorest uh, con um, states uh, currently, um, what do you think the role of the government in you know, making sure that the disbursement of grants and loans reach to the appropriate um, uh, person that needs to, uh, of course, the recipient, and also how that can solve uh, the issue of elevating you know, people from poverty. Well, I was secretary to the government, 
in Adama's church. So this question is very, very clear to me. I saw it in front of me on my table. And I'll share with you what I did. Two things that I think should happen. There are a lot of things that I went there as an academic, as a technocrat, as a civil servant or public servant, that I thought I was going to contribute. In four years, I couldn't as much as I wanted. And the reason is because at the state, states are totally different to federal. The governor is totally different to the president. The assembly in the state is totally different to the national assembly. You know, the local government, the, the commissioners, is totally different to ministers. You know, the governor is the lord in the state. I am telling you there is nothing that this is the main person. You know, so and if he's good, a lot of good things will happen. But he needs help. So two things I did. Number one, you cannot believe this, that every single federal ministry that is operating at the state has a state office. Agriculture has a agriculture office in the state. Smedan has office in the state. NDE has state in the office. Bank of Industry, they have their branch there. Bank of Agriculture, they have their branch there. The state see them as federal structure. And normally there's a gap. Mm. Because I was a federal person that I moved to the state, I said to the governor, sir, this is your resource. Everything that NDE does here, we should be interested to know. It will reduce the number of training that we're doing, and we can utilize their resources. Everything Smedan is doing here is for us. Everything, everything, everything. And I institutionalize a service-wide meeting of the federal institutions and the state system. Because I was SSG, I was able to do that. I will call all of them from the federal secretariat, call all the commissioners, and we sit down. Smedan, what are you doing with training entrepreneurs? Commissioner of Entrepreneurs, what is happening? Are you talking to each other? And gradually, I saw in two years, it was making progress. Two, on politics. I tried to say that, Your Excellency the Governor, we need to have a summit every year, a round table. You are the governor, you should be the chairman of this summit, supported by your own deputy. But all the three senators, whether you are different party or same party, must attend this summit. And they must come and tell you what they are doing at Federal in our favor. That's a great initiative. All the eight members of House of Rep, irrespective of party, they must attend. And they must tell us what they are doing. Bring all the 25 assemblymen here. They must do. Then all this political at what level. But then supplemented by the traditional rulers. In Atma, we had eight of them. All the big eight guys must attend. Let us spend two days summit discussing our state so that by the time you have all these contributions of everybody doing, then you can now see where this synergy is very, very important. I couldn't succeed to do it, but I think it's very, very important to do. I mean, that's a great thing that definitely would uh, put everyone on their toes and everyone would know the gap that is missing, you know, from the local government to um, the state. But then, um, do you think, you know, the CSOs have a role to play in all of this? Oh, yes. This is the, 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 the big, the, one of the biggest resources that we have that we are not using effectively. Non-governmental organizations, com community people, religious organizations, these are all opportunities. But if you are not careful, some of the non-governmental organizations will become more governmental than even government. They will put you under such, such, so much pressure, you cannot relax. Mm. Therefore, again, synergy is important. So keep the data of all the community-based organizations in your state, all the non-governmental, with what they do. Where is their offices? Who are their officers? What projects are they doing? Where are they? Normally, NGOs, they will just choose two local governments or three local governments. They concentrate there. You have 21 local governments. There's no NGO that is doing everything everywhere because they don't have that resources. You need that data to be able to now crunch it. If you have that data, then you need a proper commissioner or maybe the SSG who should not just be a big man running around in big cars or whatever, must be crunching numbers, putting dashboards, drawing graphs, and educating the council at their meeting that this is what is happening. When you encourage NGOs, you get the best out of them. Okay. But there are potentials sometimes that you think that they are fighting you, and then you start fisting yourself, and then you lose the whole thing. So, yes, uh, all these things are very useful, but again, I continue to stress Everything you have as a resource must be documented. You must know everybody. For example, in Adamao State, you cannot believe it. I had a booklet with telephone numbers of all the ward councils. There are 226 of them. I have their names, their wards, their telephone numbers, and I can call them. I had all the names of the local government chairman and their vice chairman and their telephone numbers. I had all the names of the assemblymen. I had all the names of the reps here, the senators. I had a booklet 
that if you just open it, you can call everyone. I mean, speaking of, of uh, the councillor's chairman in local government, mm. that's the fear. Yeah. People seem to think that there's a gap between them and the state government or even the federal government. Meanwhile, these people are the closest to the people. Synergy is key. You see, as secretary to the government, any local government chairman that I call, he will come. Just by the fact that he was elected and I was selected because of my ranking in the... So, but you have to be a good call. So you come here and say, ah, chairman, how many primary schools do you have in your local government areas? Of those primary schools, how many have headmasters? who are qualified. For those qualified, when last were they trained? You ask this ridiculous question, mm. chairman will start saying, ah, Dr. Bin, why are you asking me all this nonsense? But it is important. If you don't ask these questions, you will not know the quality of education that is going to your children. You will not know whether they are games teachers. You will not know whether they have football space to play football. This is important, but if you leave it, the local government chairman is a politician. He is just playing politics until the two or three years will finish. And then you will see his house, that is nice. He would have bought a good car, but his own, he has made progress. So the rest is, but you have to drive him positively to make sure that life changes. Indeed. I am a data person. Mm. I am an evidence-based technocrat. And therefore, I milk everything. I must know where every primary health care system is. I mean, I, I, I wanted to even ask about transparency, but then, you know, speaking about data, saying you already have it, and if there is anybody that needs to know the details, that they can easily reach out for clarification. So, I mean, that's a good thing. But then, uh, based on the knowledge, quickly, mm. can, can you tell us, you know, best, you know, um, international practices that you've seen that could be, um, you know, used in the national, um, of course, disbursement of grants? I, I think, I think um, it, 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 I continue to stress that the best practice is to ensure that you utilize qualified people to do this. Not just qualified by paper, people who are committed, who are prepared to talk to people nicely, who are prepared to resolve issues, mm. who are constantly open to you to show you where they are. There is no agenda, I am, this is my tribe or this is my religion, I'm helping my brothers. No, no, no. You need people who are prepared even 2 o'clock in the morning, you wake them up, they can tell you what they are doing. Mm. You need that. And then certainly, data, data, data. Mm. Data is the key. <laughs> if you want to be transparent, accountable, and also to showcase whether you are making progress or you are learning, data is key. I mean, you've covered it up. Thank you so yeah. much, Dr. Omar Bende, uh, for joining us, the former, of course, coordinator of National Social Investment Program. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Of course.